Hello and welcome back to Sound Advice. This week we have a very special episode for you. I was recently invited to the Liverpool City Region Music Board's Remap Report launch event at District to bring you an exclusive panel from industry experts who spoke at the event on some of the challenges faced by black music makers in the city and some of the plans to alleviate those challenges in the future. But what is the Remap Report? Well, here is the report's author, Matt Flynn, to tell you a little bit more about it. I'm Dr Matthew Flynn. I'm a senior lecturer in music industries at the University of Liverpool. Uh, and I'm the author of the Remap Report. Uh, the project came about um, from a conversation Yao Arusu and I had as I was doing some research on the impact of all music musicians across the live music sector, uh, and the impact of the pan pandemic on them. And Yao approached me and said, I've had an idea to do some research specifically about black music maker experience for a while. Would you be interested? Um, so that started off as an initially, initially a small project um, that was interviewing people who'd been involved in a project that Yao was involved in called Liverpool Ones back in 2011. And basically the idea was that we followed up with those people who'd been involved in that project to see what had happened to them in terms of career trajectory and those types of things. Um, out of that came more questions than answers. And so we decided to evolve the research into surveying um, current black music makers uh, and industry practitioners in the Liverpool city region. Uh, and then we did some follow-up focus groups with young aspiring professionals. The idea to connect the questions together about um, why are black musicians underrepresented uh, in the Liverpool city region? Um, why is it more difficult for success to translate uh, for black music makers? And so the research, over two years, we conducted these three pieces of research and then I put them together. Um, that, that came, that produced a lot of insight, a lot of findings. And then working with the Black Music Action Group, we worked through the findings of the research and then I authored it, but there was a lot of info from the Black Music Action Group uh, in terms of putting the report together, which has produced these 16 key findings as to why there's challenges for black music makers and industry professionals in the region. 22 recommendations to address those challenges um, and then really the final sort of you know a call to action for everyone involved in the sector um, to, to, to be active and engaged in addressing those challenges. So without further ado here is the Remap Report launch panel hosted by BBC Radio Merseyside's Ganan Adamu. My name is Yao Wusu, I'm a creative consultant so I work with artists, brands, organisations um, on a variety of different things, both locally, nationally and, inter uh, and internationally, actually. Um, and that can be anything from like editorial stuff. Can, um, a couple of years ago, I've done a project called Union Black for Google, which looked at black music and its impact both within the UK and, and further afield. But then obviously locally, I've done stuff for like Lymph, Lymph Academy, work with artists, managed artists, um, and bits and bobs. And I am lucky enough to have worked on this project. Fantastic. Um, Emmy? My name's Emmy Anore. I <coughs> am a race equality project manager at the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority. So working across a number of race equality programmes. Uh, I'm also a co-author of um, a book called From the People, which looked at the impact of the Windrush generation on the British music scene. And... Um, and, uh, and and also um, you know a supporter of uh, of um, you know local black musicians. When I say supporter, I mean I mean my son's a DJ <laughs> <laughs> and a, and a driving round. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Brody Arthur. I work for the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority. I'm leading up all of the engagement and outreach for the Race Equality Hub, which goes across the six boroughs in the Liverpool City region. And we are developing a few different programmes of work, and this sort of sits under, or some of the findings that, that we've seen in the report, sort of sit under some of those key areas of focus that the Hub are working on. So I was really interested in being a part of this today as a Liverpool resident, as an activist, as an artist myself, and then also within my role at LCRCA. Hello, my name is Misha Sefia. I'm a Black Vibes and Music ambassador and artist, and I also work in higher education as an EDI project coordinator. And I'm really happy to be here today, especially growing up in Liverpool and just seeing all the work that's going on. It's nice to see change happening and to see it so relevant in conversations today. 
Hello, good evening now, I think it is. <laughs> uh, my name is Eunice Opianaga and I wear a number of different hats in the music industry. Um, I'll tell you a few that are relevant to today's conversation. So I'm the head of diversity for an organisation called UK Music which is an advocacy and lobbying organisation. Um, we engage with the government to try and change legislation and influence that around music. Um, we put out reporting around the music industry and convene um, some of the major trade organisations across the industry. Um, I also have my own project and event management consultancy called Inspire, and that embroilers various different types of projects from live music to talent development projects um, here and in Nigeria as well. Um, one of the projects that I wasn't, I wasn't doing that under Inspire at the time, but um, is the MOBO Awards as well. And they're a producer for the show and actually my very first MOBO Awards 10 years ago um, or more was actually in Liverpool. So um, you hold a special place in my heart for that. Um, and I also sit on the board of an amazing youth charity called Small Green Shoots. Um, and I'm their chairwoman there and it does amazing work with working with underrepresented young people, primarily from um, socioeconomic backgrounds um, and uh, ethnicity backgrounds that might provide the, present barriers to them as well. So really pleased to be part of this conversation, invited to speak today. Thank you very much. Don't we have a beautiful panel? Can we have a round of applause, please? You want... <laughs> so Eunice, I want to stick with you. So the report highlights barriers and inequalities in the music industry faced by black people. Can you share some of those specific barriers and inequalities, please? I think you've heard most of them today, um, which a lot of them comes from access. One of that is really knowing what opportunities are out there and how you can, how you can, um, how you can access them and awareness as well is another one. Having people who understand black music and black music pr practitioners in the right positions to be able to champion and that doesn't matter what background they're from. Um, other barriers are often to do with a, mi a mindset, really, of... How do I explain this? A mindset, and this is from lived experience and conversations with other people, a mindset of knowing if there is a place for you, yourself in there, and second-guessing yourself, and not necessarily pushing yourself forward for that reason as well. That's often a big barrier. Um, and then, as we've discussed, generally just racism, really. Yeah. Just racism. Just racism in a lot of different sectors across the industry. And then I'd also say with that as well, um, is having people in positions who are going to be able to understand that maybe you might not have been in that, you might not have had that opportunity before, um, and be able to guide and walk you through that or give you that opportunity as a first step. I mean, just as an example, um, just in terms of event work and TV production work that I've been part of, if you haven't got the, if you you may have been working in your sector or in your kind of genre of music um, or media in, in, in kind of that you're familiar with and want to expand and do bigger projects and grow basically, but if you don't have a reputation or you've not been booked for that show or you've not booked for that gig before, it's, it's often unlikely that you will be called up for it because people have the same cycle of people that they use over and over and over and over again. So it's, those are some of the opportunities and, I mean, sorry, some of the barriers that I would say are in place, really. Yeah. And kind of sticking with that same question, I want to come to you, Yao. Can you answer that, but from a Liverpool perspective? Well, what I'd say is it's all that, but compounded by being in Liverpool. Yeah. And, you know, being away from a substantial black community or models of, of success, um, high levels of success, it's the lack of visibility. So everything just compounds when you, 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 you put that into, into a place like Liverpool. So for everything that we give, and we, we were talking about this earlier today, it's like for everything that Liverpool is as a music city, for black people um, who make music or want to work within the music field, it, 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 
it doesn't deliver on that promise, yeah. right? And if it does, there's, there's something to be said about burnout, there's, stuff, there's something to be said about a kind of a lack of true support, do you know what I mean? I've watched you know, the likes of Kofi and you know, Mike Lowry is another prime example. It's like extremely talented music creators who done everything they could do and traveled and done whatever they could do, but were never able to maybe get to the critical mass and have that certain opportunities here within you know, this city of music to be able to have a foundation whereby, like they didn't have the chance to be a Jamie Webster or a Red Rum Club and all that. And when you look at the facts, it, it's not, it can't be skill. No. Do you know what I mean? It can't be based <laughs> on anything like that. It, it's got to be things related to race. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And, and to me, that, that is <coughs> what Eunice is talking about, which is a national thing or an international thing to some yeah. degree. Um, but when it kind of manifests here in Liverpool <laughs> and fundamentally, you know, you then look at people who are like, you know, the industry professionals and we've got, we've got some stellar industry, but don't like caves here and, you know, there's, but there's, there's massive challenges there in terms of being able to, to, for those individuals to actually maximise what they can do, not just exist, yeah. not just to sustain to a point where they can go, okay, I've had a decent career, but actually to, to, to be what they really are, which is world class, but not necessarily in that position where they're seen as world class or recognised as world class. And just to end it, we, we had a long conversation about the real thing. It's like, yeah. no one will ever, you know, Dave and Rich, you, you've done all the work on this, but like, no one would, top, top band, you know, the biggest band, arguably of what, the 70s, late 70s, <laughs> what we call them, biggest pop rock band, you know, should be national treasures, should definitely be local treasures, but like, a lot of people don't even know what they've done in the music space, never mind how they flipped it into the economic thing, like there's models there, yeah. but if, they, if, if, if you can get to that height and still not be recognised, like, you can see, do you know what yeah. I mean, you can see the impact. Because even before then, you had the chance, yeah. you know, I think um, there was, do you remember Eurovision, do you remember there was the poster, and the poster only had white scouse artists, and it was just like, wait a minute, you've literally just wiped out the history of Liverpool. Can I you just know? add something onto what you've both said that I forgot? Media representation. Yeah. That's a massive <coughs> barrier. Massive barrier to how black people generally mm -hmm. and black artists are, are projected into, the, um, into society, really. And then off the back of that... <laughs> we're there, we're there. What, is he special? Is that, <laughs> is that a Liverpool City region thing? Or something? <laughs> you dropped any hints for 20 minutes. The hook you, you, you never dropped any hints, did you? <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Sorry, you... Yeah, no, 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 no. I'm just saying off the back of what you're saying, I think media representation is one barrier that we cannot afford to forget in this conversation because it has a tremendous impact but, as to how everybody sees and perceives black people and black artists and you've just given an example there and it's sad really because <coughs> you know everyone sitting on this panel is fighting in their own little way um, it's not going as fast as what we would like it to but it's slowly happening but it should have you know like you but, know but again I, you know we and Matt talked about this and me and Kev have spoke about this loads and it's like considering how British black British music is yeah. dominating in so many ways over the last 15 years. We're in Liverpool, yeah. a music city. None of this actually makes sense. It's true. It doesn't make sense. It's it so doesn't true. make sense because if it was, there's, a, there's an economic reason for supporting black music wherever it comes from. There's models that have worked in Birmingham, yeah. there's models that have worked in Manchester. So it, it, it does seem odd that Liverpool's this far behind in one area. Do you know what I mean? And it's so <coughs> substantially behind. Because um, it, it doesn't equate with what's actually happening yeah. in the marketplace. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's where we're trying to find the answer because it's nothing to do with the lack of talent. Yeah. So is it a case of there's a kind of a, a magnetic force field that just keeps on pulling, pulling people down and just not letting us escape, I don't, I, 
you know, this is what we need to keep the conversation going. I may want to come to you. So you head up the LCR Race Equality Hub. I've been promoted. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you've been there long enough. You've been there from the beginning. Um, how do the findings of the VMAP report align with some of the research findings that you and your team have discovered across other industries within the region? Does it match up? Yeah. B very broadly, yeah, yeah, it does match up. So uh, some of the kind of key features of, um, of, uh, of, of the, the city region's economy in relation to race and, uh, and race equality are, you know, lack of leadership, lack mm. of role models, lack of people in, la lack of uh, diversity across uh, leadership roles, lack of investment in in, um, in in lack of business support and infrastructure, advice, guidance, um, all of those kind of things. Plus, this, you know, some of the other things that other panel members have talked about. They're common features across industry across the whole uh, across the city region. The thing I want to mention as well is um, <clears throat> is career pathways, yeah. apprenticeships, for example. Uh, there's just a dearth of those opportunities for uh, for black communities within within uh, within the city region, and that mirrors um, quite a lot of what goes on. There are, there are a couple of, you know, Yao mentioned before about you know those general features, but they are particularly compounded when it comes to the cultural industries yeah. as well. That um, that not only is there a, is there um, uh, you know all of those th features that I mentioned, but some of the kind of ancillary roles as well. Mm. Uh, something like, you know, for one, for every one person who appears on stage, there are kind of five people, six people who've, had, who, who've, who've supported them to get onto, yeah. stage, onto the stage as well. So there's a dearth of uh, producers, sound engineers, yeah. promoters, um, publicists, uh, the whole range of kind of, you know, ancillary kind of um, roles. There's a kind of absolute day there. So what we find is that the music industry replicates the inequality and the discriminatory practices that exist across industry within the city region uh, and compounds it even more. And, you know, the point that Yao made is a really important one. Black British music punches well above its weight. Yeah. Uh, and here we are in a you know, UNESCO music heritage city without, uh, and, and, and there's a complete absence of the contribution that, uh, that, you know, that black artists made in the past and today as well. The Beatles have got a phenomenal body of work, you know, unparalleled. But, you know, we can't keep banging on about <laughs> the Beatles. I mean, I imagine Newcastle, you know, Newcastle haven't had anyone since the Animals, <laughs> to, for example, and they were in the 60s. Uh, I know there's been a revival in Coventry of two-tone and everything else, but that, was the la but, but that was the last, you know, as a world music, UNESCO world music heritage city, we, we, should, we need to be looking about how we can build on our traditions and legacy in order to move forward in the future. But also, that's not a, a, just a moral thing, is it? It's actual, like, well, there's opportunity behind it. It's like, if it was purely like, oh, we should do this because we feel sorry for those black artists, <laughs> I'd, I'd get it, I'd get some apathy, can but, I, like, I, I don't you think... Make a, there's another point that I, that, that, I, that I really want to make. We did... You know, we have an economic department within this uh, city region, uh, within the combined authority. Race equality, race inequality, uh, the price of race inequality across the country is somewhere between 12 and 40 billion, right? 12, 12 and 40 billion. That's, about, that's in lost investments, lost taxation, um, compensation, um, uh, you know, uh, lost tax revenue, and so on and so forth. How that translates, so 12 to 40 billion nationally is probably what we spend, well, probably what the country spends on uh, early years and primary education, so it's not insubstantial. If you translate that into the city region, it's about 450 million uh, is per annum, you know, per year. Uh, that's broadly equivalent to, what, to, the, to the entire budget of St. Helens Council, so once again, it's not substantial. That is the price of race inequality. Now, obviously... Wait, do you mean like that lack of, of yeah. proper... In okay. Yeah. 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 So I just want to add to just some promising, something promising for you. So at UK Music, we're actually developing a report 
uh, towards to be uh, hopefully launched at the beginning of next year, which is assessing the economic impact of black music, UK well, black music. So we definitely should talk so, about so that. So let's hope. Obviously, they'll do that nationally. It'd be nice to have some kind of regional, regional breakdown mm -hmm. of, those, of those figures because we can use that, uh, hopefully, to, to agitate and to agitate for more, for more uh, investment into. Uh, so, so not only are we losing out, you know, on some fantastic artists and building upon our kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, historical historical legacy of, you know, you know of uh, historical musical heritage. But we're also losing out economically. There's, yeah. there's real economic opportunities the studio, there. There's people in the room today who've got their own studios <clears throat> who will do, create in Cove. We had a conversation before about how many songs have been recorded in your studio that have made it onto BBC Radio One Extra in this month alone. And that's not being promoted, the work that you're doing, I'm sure. I'm, I might be wrong in this, but there was a song recently that was just put on Netflix, which was released years and years ago, and I'm sure that was recorded in your studio. And if it wasn't, it was recorded in another studio, similar, doing work similar to what you're doing with black musicians and it's just not celebrated at all so if you think about how much it costs to hire a studio and the revenue and all of the things that you'd be putting back into the city region by your business being promoted in the way that it should be and, and all of the work that you're doing being highlighted and you getting your flowers while you're still here and being able to pass that on again is another loss it's criminal when you think about it and you know it's great that some of the artists that you're working with are getting that recognition and they're getting to where they want to be but as Emmy said one about all those people in the background who were doing the producing, who were, you know, giving discounted rates in the studio. I'm sure there's been many a times where I, I know over the years, whilst you've been supporting artists, you probably haven't even broke even, but you've continued to do that because that's what it's about. And it's about all of us sort of harnessing that passion that we've got and the support that we've got for our own communities and translating that to the allies that can support and can and have got the pay strings and have got all of the access to all of these different things so I, can I just jump on it like the, the track was recorded in Coach Studio okay um, <laughs> no no I'm just saying it was number th it was the it was the number three the top three Shazam rap song not in the UK in the world in the UK it was number by a, one by, by, but, but in the, think about in the world rap yeah. music in the world so you're beating all those Americans you're beating Drake you're bringing all that stuff that goes on out the States this guy from Liverpool so it wasn't just recorded in Coach Studio it was on Liverpool <laughs> The point being, the point being is that Liverpool artist isn't, hasn't got necessarily got access, despite that success, access to some of the resources that uh, uh, artists who wouldn't even be in the top thousand, yeah. who has a different colour skin in this city would get. Yeah. And that's where the inequality lies. And like, I, I agree with Coco. Like on that thing, Matt will know. So when he said about the studios that these black artists feel comfortable, it's all his studio. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like, so like the fact that that's the he's like he's the hub of it, and we just done a piece for the LiverpoolMusicCity.com. Anyway, shameless plug, but we done a piece <laughs> on Coach Studio. No, because again, you know, like Kempston will get the praise, and obviously people, you know, and as rightly they should. But like Coach's been doing this thing for over a decade, and if artists aren't going through that studio, they're probably just recording at home, and that's yeah. the reality of it. But when we talk about music studios and when we talk about you know who's doing that thing behind, he, he, his studio probably well, doesn't get the credit he deserves. And it's, he probably, as a businessman, probably doesn't get the support, business support that he would, do you know what I mean, all the opportunities. And that's where, that's where we look at these inequalities. And, and I think, yeah. but also, um, I think the sad part about it is things can change yeah absolutely. and they can easily change and what what the community is asking for you know like emmy said it's a drop in the ocean of what we're asking for there's um i went to another event and it was just the gender index um organization it's one of your fancy events with one, fancy, and that. one of my fa my my fancy events <laughs> <laughs> you've got to be in those fine rooms in it to see yeah. what's going on um you've got the illuminati <laughs> <laughs> listen <laughs> I'm so small, this chair is killing me. <laughs> <laughs> Sliding all over the place with me big ass. But um, it's professional. I don't talk like this in my fancy events. <laughs> That's but, uh, why we're not getting any money. <laughs> Trust me, she is. Trust me. Trust me. Um, and what they've, so what they've done, 
with the gender index is that they've started mapping. It's all to do with women and business. So what they're doing now is they're mapping all the city councils all over the UK, the constituencies, and how much they're investing in, in female businesses, in women businesses. So then they're more or less saying to the other constitu um, to the constituents, look how much you know yeah. this person, this council is putting, and then kind of hoping that will shame them into invest into more businesses. So maybe that's something that we need to look at. But that economic uh, impact stuff, I remember having this conversation yeah. with Amo three years ago, and um, we were talking about black music and the impact of black music. And he's like, the only way, and the University of Westminster, right? So the only way to really make a case was the economic impact, it because it was like, you can't really run, and this kind of probably is a segue, about Black Lives Matter, but like you can't run away from data like that. No, you can't yeah. deny it. Yeah, you, you can can't. you can make whatever story up you want, but you can't deny it. You can't know what deny mean? data. Misha, hi love. Hi. Um. So black black lives in music. So they did their first widespread um, report on black British experience working in the UK music industry. Um. You've heard what everyone else has been saying, but from your point of view, why um why was that report so important? I think at the time I was in university and um, I was in my second or third year and I discovered that we had a partnership with Black Lives and Music and that was something that I had no idea about. And I think it's so important because it gives you hope and like you spend so much of your life as a black person working 10 times harder than the next person to get any type of look in. When you see that different research projects are being made and people are having conversations, it just gives you a bit of leeway to like live your life a bit more in like the plainest format. Like It's so hard sometimes to see past everything when it's things that are happening in your everyday life and it's being ignored or being passed off as something that you should just try and get over. So I think when research projects like this come out and when it came out specifically with Blim, for me, I was like, wow, like this is incredible. I was made up, I think I cried because I was like, this, this feels like some type of projection. <clears throat> this feels like I'm not gonna go into university and be having the same conversations with the same small group of tutors that care. And then after that, I ended up having a conversation with Roger who runs Blim and my working relationship with them started from there. And I was more so stunned at the fact that the university that I attended had a partnership with an organization like them and they weren't shouting it from the rooftops and trying to do everything that they could do to improve the, the life of the students that were there because there was a massive Afro-Caribbean society and it was such a big hub for all the music and creation that came out of the university. Even when you look at the alumni, they were all doing so well and there was just no connection there because they didn't feel like as if they were supportive when they were going through education. But you know what I loved about what you said there was the report gave you hope, you know, um, and I think that's what, you know, even though there's, there's, there's a lot of frustration, I think a lot of us have been in this industry for so long that some, in some at some point we've lost hope, you know, but we have to keep on going because there's a legacy that we need to leave behind, yeah. you know, for your age group and, you know, and beyond. Um, I want to come back to you, Emmy. You know, we've talked about data. Um, the Race Equality Hub's been doing some research themselves. But can you talk about some of, like, a number of the programmes and initiatives, like, that the Hub is looking at um, running. We are very much in the infancy of trying to collect all of that data. We are following up from the fantastic work that Emmy and the mayoral programme delivery team done. So a lot of the work that they've done was sort of getting out and doing projects across the city region, engaging artists. They've done a fantastic project called Generations for Change, which garnered real life case studies of black residents and black ethnic Asian minority residents across the city region and they become part of the case study that built the business case for the hub needing to exist and so once we got in and we started feeling out sort of where our parameters were the Metro Mayor has got devolved powers in strategic investment, so it made the most sense for the hub to focus on those areas of delivery where we can have the most impact, which would be leadership, employability and business support. But underpinning both of those, all three of those strands, we've got co-production and systems change. So what that means is we want to speak truth to power 
these events are fantastic, gathering the data is fantastic, but how do we get in the rooms to tell the people who can make the difference? Because we can all talk about it, but we haven't got the power to make the changes that need to be changed. So we are working really closely with big institutions in the, in the Liverpool City region and nationally to try and bring a sort of cohesive approach together so that we're not only engaging the, the minority you know groups across the city region and trying to get them into jobs it's not we're not doing employment support we're doing employability because we understand mm -hmm. that the needs of our community differ from access to childcare, you know mental health support all of these other things all encompass whether or not we're going to make it in life whether or not we've got a chance so it's not enough to go oh okay well we throw a bit of money on a leadership scheme and that'll be fantastic no we want to make sure that there is placements and there's places for these people to go once they've got that our question all the time is and what next so we've did that and what now what what can we do with that stuff so we are building uh, we've just commissioned our business support package which will be going live soon so that's all being finalised within the organisation and with the partner who won the bid to do that. So we'll be delivering business support across the city region to all manner of businesses, so Cove definitely get in touch. Um, <laughs> and then we will be doing leadership programmes, so they will look, at the moment we're not sure how it's going to look, whether it's going to be an accredited leadership programme, whether it's going to be multiple different programmes, but we're working in partnership with all of our communities to make sure that this, this incentive feels different. This doesn't feel like something being done to our communities, but it's something that they're asking us to do. So we're engaging with them, we're finding out where are the gaps, you know. We know that the census data shows that only 16% of the Liverpool city region's diverse, and that's not just the black communities, that's all communities that don't identify as white. Anyone who's black will know 80% of your family are not filling a census form in. So we can double that already. It's definitely not 16%. We are becoming a majority. And it's important that we were able to disperse all of the information, all of the access to anything that's going on. So aside from the projects that we're going to run and all of the programmes that we're doing, we're really trying to feel out what is already existing. How does it work and what can we do to influence it to either work better or to support it, to build capacity and to grow into the initiatives that we know that they should be because we know that there's definitely not a lack there. We know we need the support across all of those fields and then wider. And I suppose I'd just add on top of that, as an artist in the city region, a lot of the work that I've done within my activism and just as a freelancer anyway has been to support artists to you know, get Arts Council funding or, you know, whatever it might be, linking people up. And there's a gentleman who should have been here tonight, but he couldn't make it, and he's got a really great idea about an incentive in the music world. So I'll be grabbing onto loads of years later to give you his email. Um, but in, in whole, we're working alongside any organisations that want to work with us to diversify their teams, to help us to deliver the programmes that we want to deliver. You know, we're not, uh, we're not a delivery hub so all of the work that we're doing is going to be commissioned out to other organizations through our bidding process so you know there will be opportunities for businesses and, and for ind individuals within that as well because we're making sure that all of the delivery of our programs anyone who bids in for that work they have to be 51 percent ethnic led from whatever background that might be but we're making sure that whatever work goes out it's led by the people who understand the, the barriers that we're facing who have got lived experience of it and who actually are passionate about making sure that we drive it forward we're only here for two years we're only funded for two years so we want to make sure we have as much impact as we can to potentially argue the fact that we need to remain to exist but we're hopefully going to work ourselves out of a job <laughs> that's the point that's the point thanks Brody and just to add just to add some context to uh, what Brody said um we uh, the race equality hub has been funded to the tune of uh, sorry the race equality program across the air uh, across the you know, combined authority has been funded to the tune of around about £3.2 million. Now, one of the things we recognise is that, um, and, and, the, and, and the Race Quality Hub has been, has took, you know, most of that money. 
Uh, most of that money um, has, gone, has gone to the hub, so that's very much our flagship kind of project. There have been other projects. Brody mentioned uh, the World um, uh, Generations for Change, um, and we had another project called the World Reimagined, which was, an, which was once again another cultural, cultural sector kind of program. So many of our programs involve support for the cultural sector um, and, and, and enabling black artists, black individuals to get a foothold within the industry and get opportunities uh, that will, uh, but sustainable opportunities, not opportunities that come along every October, um, that come along every October and then you've got to wait another year uh, for the next October to come around before you get you know, yet another commission. We're looking to develop something that's long-term and something that's sustainable. And, you know, the, the 3.2 million, as Brody said, is only available till September of next year. But we do recognise that, that more funding will be necessary. We do want, we have a long-term strategy without long-term funding. But we know that, you know, that uh, the long-term funding is, is going to be the only way that all of this work is going to be sustainable. So, sorry, I forgot to mention, but in terms of like how people from the music industry specifically would engage with the hub, so all of those programmes will obviously be open to absolutely everybody, but outside of that, we are creating networks. So, you know, pro profession, Black Professional Liverpool, we're creating networks with Lloyds Bank, and we've gone into partnerships with the DWP, Diageo, Hayes Recruitment, and so we are going to be developing all of these different sort of mini parts of the work that are about connecting industry professionals with musicians, with producers, with whoever it might be. So we're in conversation at the moment with Lippa and Sharice Weaver, who's the head of EDI over at Lippa. And what we're trying to create is a black artist network where we can meet, we can get together quarterly at Lippa and we can all sort of exchange work that we're working on. You know, we can perform, we can, we can be free in that space, but we can also network and have the opportunity to present our things to the people that, that have got that hold the power mm. within the city region and within the arts, within the arts culture across the yeah. UK. Okay. Je Jenny, Jenny. We got Jenny 10 minutes, John. guys. Sorry, sorry, 10 really minutes. quickly. <laughs> Jenny John made a, made a point in, in, you know, about, about activism. And I think that network that Brody mentioned, if we can get a collection of people who, who want to get a foothold within the industry, that's, that's potentially quite powerful. Um, activism is the thing that's driven the way, we, we wouldn't have got any money. I mean, the, the 3.2 million investment is the biggest investment in race equality in the history of our city region. That would not have happened without activism. Yeah. Um, the, to, to, to enable change to be made, it's really important that those people who've got, a, who've got, who've got an, you know, like Yao and, and Jenny and others, uh, but also those emerging artists as well. Uh, it's, it's important that you get together and you have an activist mindset in order to kind of lever, leverage the kind of levers of power. Thank you. Um, Misha, I want to come to you. We haven't, we haven't heard from you enough. Mm -hmm. um, so from a Black Lives, in, Black Lives in Music perspective, how can we ensure that this regional story is part of the national strategy and agenda? I think it has to be, like, regardless. Like, we, I feel like the world is kind of doing it for us in the sense that, like, these are things that streamline into people's everyday working lives, personal lives, day-to-day, -day, subconsciously, consciously. Like, these types of, these types of, like, research and everything are things that can't be ignored because it's people's real lives. And I think it's time that people stop, that people stop, being forced to go through their trauma in order to educate people and like working with different organizations and everybody grouping together and having these conversations having these different spaces where people could come together and engage with each other is wonderful and it's amazing and I think it's really important also that organizations feel 
uncomfortable sometimes in knowing that they're doing things wrong. I think that a lot of the time people are too scared to say, we did this wrong, so then they can do it right. And that's something that we find in Blim a lot of the time is that people are really wanting help and they know in the areas that they need to improve, but they don't want to admit it because they, they want to believe that everything that they're doing is contributing to the ultimate goal. So I think that there just needs to be a lot more honesty and then that ultimately will lead to it just taking over really because it you can't you can't ignore people's lives you can't ignore people's experiences you can't ignore people's truths because at the end of the day that's it it's what makes the world turn and each individual person's experience is ultimately gonna, gonna add to especially as musicians like the amount that you contribute to society to the world to everything your individual experience is going to be a part of your journey so i don't think that it's possible for it to be ignored any longer just wanted to add, yeah. I was just going to add on to what you said about honesty and when you asked about national, how does this become a national story? I think it's our honesty yeah. with each other. So we're in Liverpool right now. How are we being honest with people in Manchester in the same situation? <laughs> it's about being honest in this report so that actually other people have the confidence to be honest also. And we're storytelling and we're sharing, as you said as well, about what's happening and then doing things together, activism. Um, it's great that we're having this conversation in Liverpool, but as we've established, this isn't a Liverpool problem. It's not, it's a, it's a UK, it's a world problem that we're dealing with here. So we have to, I really love what you said about we have to be honest with ourselves, our own individual experience, those we're witnessing of other people's and how much we are willing to step forward and help that situation as well. And you know what it is, it's, a, it's that honesty and you mentioned Manchester, it, it is, it's collective action, you know, from, we're all from, I mean, you know, we're all scouts apart from you, Eunice. <laughs> honorary. Which is, Minor, which is, honorary. No, which is good because I think <laughs> there's so much that we can learn from outside. Mm. You know, I think Liverpool in one aspect is like a bubble. We are like a village, but a very experienced village. But also there's so much that I've learned and maybe the majority of us on this panel and even here from working outside of the city and working yeah. internationally. So we talk about knowledge. We have to bring that and say, actually, what's working in Nigeria, what's working in America, well, America's big, but different parts of the state. You know, I spent yeah. a lot of time in Atlanta. Um, sorry, I spent a lot of time in New York, you know, in Brooklyn. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think it's a collective because we have to, it's, it's not as transfer, a lot, a lot of this. Um, but sticking with you, Eunice, in your quote supporting this, the, the REMAP report, you mentioned the fact that we have been bold and that you believe that this report may inspire um, other cities and music communities across the UK. What do you think other cities can learn from this work? That nothing's going to happen to you if you help people, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. And I said, I think it's bold because in any scenario that you're in, whether it's, you know, someone shortchanged you in a shop or a bully in the playground, when you stand up for yourself or somebody else, that takes courage. It takes a lot of courage yeah. to do that. Um, and I think it's bold because it also requires you to be, again, honest with yourself. I think it was mentioned earlier, or maybe in the conversation I was having earlier, that actually when you are stepping forward to advocate and actually your city region and you're actually mm. an organisation, you've got to bring your skeletons out of the cupboard to make sure that a problem can be dealt with. So to stand up and say, actually, you know what? There's an issue here. Yeah. And we have to face ourselves and we have to face the people that we may not have supported is a bold statement because yeah. it's also very easy not to do anything. Yeah. It's really very easy not to do anything as well for institutions. And you know what? Liverpool is a city that fights. We, you know, I say this all the time. Yeah, we are a musical city, but we are a social justice city as well. So we a lot of the changes that we've seen happen, it happens through culture and arts. I think what... Mm. It's, it's crazy because we spearhead so much, but then it stays like that instead of going to the next level, as, as we've mentioned um, earlier on. So I think there's a lot that so many cities can learn from us, but also 
our city needs to be honest, our council needs to be honest, the city region needs to be honest about how, you know, they treat um, artists, black artists in the city. When, you know, going back to that post there during Eurovision, I couldn't believe they even got signed off. I, honestly, and that's, and that's not even speaking as someone who's from the BBC. This is speaking as just a lover of art, you know, lover of this city, a lover of um, the people in the city. How could you look at that, at that poster and think that that is okay to sign off during one of the biggest music festivals the city has seen and not be ashamed? You know, so I think these, you know, these events, these, you know, having this conversation has to take it somewhere. You know, because it, it can't carry on any, any longer. It really can't, you know. So we've only got five minutes left. So be, um, if you could change one thing about the UK music industry, what would make it significantly better for black people? What would it be, Yao? Big question. Do you know what, honestly, what would make it better? That stuff like this doesn't have to exist. Yeah. yeah. Because if, 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 if we can work to eradicate any need for intervention like this around race, it would make the UK music industry better because we hopefully would have reached our purpose and, and, and there's no need for that, no need for this. And again, it would, it would improve because there's an economic... There's a social, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a premise that has been proven, there's facts and figures behind it. It's like, if your organization is more diverse in every single way, it will do better. Oh, there's sorry. facts, there's yeah. facts. So, you know, if we do that, if we achieve this within the race space, and all the intersectionality that goes with race, the music in the shoe will be better. So that's my one wish that we don't, we get to a point where we don't need to do these things. Amazing, thank you very much. Emmy. Uh, I would say that you know one of the one of the things I love about Black British music is its diversity. It, it's not just R and B. It's not just grime or hip hop across classical music, folk music, indie, um, indie and jazz. And I and I would like. So who, who, who's that? Gospel. gospel. I knew I'm so I sorry. Mean. Yeah, so sorry. <laughs> Go Founder of the gospel gospel, gospel festival. Gospel. There. Gospel as well. Coming back in September. <laughs> I would, I would, I would like to see the uh, the powers that be in uh, in the British music industry set a target for world domination, which um, and 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 using Black British music as its kind of a, as the key kind of driver for that. Its its level of diversity and creativity is just unparalleled across the world. One of the things we have that, the, that we don't have in the States is a lack of racial segregation and that yeah. impact of that on our music means that we share ideas and we share, and you know, people just flip between genres without any kind of real yeah. thought that it's, a, that it's a big deal. And I think, you know, that potential, uh, setting targets to, uh, to, to maximize that potential, and that's, what, that's something I'd like to see. Can I, can I just intersect? Um, only because you, you mentioned something and even referencing Anu, it's like, I think we one of the things we've got to change to some degree, and this is not to disrespect black music artists in any stretch, but also making sure there's enough black music practitioners who aren't artists to be able to support. Do you understand? Because yeah. for like every... Ma no, but for, this is a fact. For yeah. every manager, competent manager, they might manage five artists. Yeah. So if you have managers that either understand black music culture or are black and are experiencing that it's going to have so much impact yeah. and i think we need yeah, like if true. anu's not around there's no gospel festival yeah. so one person is driven i know there's organization and you've got people you work with but if you don't exist that festival doesn't happen do you know what i mean eric yeah. same with you with this venue if you're not in this venue as an owner there's there's a lot of black music events that just don't happen and i think really we've really got to make con concerted effort yeah. to do that and in actual fact i think that would actually have a lot more impact if we support the individuals, the music, and we know from Power Up, the yeah. professionals and those organizations and build the capacity because if you do, there's a lot more talent that can come through at the moment. Yeah. I think we've got abundance of music. Kofi, you'll know. Abundance of music artists, but even you're at a point where you're going, I can't actually deal with the amount of people who want to come through the studio. Yeah. So what you actually need is three or four more of you mm -hmm. 
and that would help deal with the demand. Do, do you understand yeah. what I'm saying? So it's it's yeah. it's something that I just I just wanted to say that's before so we ended was that I just think there's got to be some kind of I agree. thinking around that we, we because that's where the power is. That is exactly where the power is. Um, so no, I totally agree, Brody. Um, for me, I'd probably say empowerment of the artists because I think in a digital age where we've got so much reach to be able to put our music out any which way we want to without management, without production companies, with just the likes of people like Kofi with Spearhead and great initiatives in the city region. How is it that we are where we are? You know, mm. I think it's a, it's a lack of empowerment. It's a lack of people knowing it's a see me, be me kind of vibe. Nobody knows that black artists exist of any calibre other than grime or hip hop or, you know, R&B. Nobody knows. I went to a event up in Nosley the other week and there was a social activist photographer there and he wanted people to write on a piece of paper, like bold statements so we could get a picture. And I wrote on mine, black and scout, yes, we exist. Because yeah. actually, there's no representation of us whatsoever unless we're being murdered or unless we're talking about murdering people. Yeah. And that's the sort of stuff that we're pushing to the top and that's the empowerment that we see. Mm -hmm. And then that trickles down into the, the next generation and so on yeah. and so forth. So I think empowerment of our artists and that starts with us and that starts with, with our communities, respecting yeah. the art that's out there and respecting the artists that exist and promoting them in whichever way we can and supporting those people who've got great initiatives initiatives like Kofi once did years ago I see loads of, of people who are like him and I think mm, why aren't you doing that like what is it that's stopping you yeah. from taking that next step and it's because we're not empowered to do so yeah. I don't even think it's that I think the industry just doesn't get us it's like yeah. since I started sharing more on social media I get comments like oh my god that accent and I'm thinking there's been black <laughs> scouts for, for decades you know but it still yeah. seems like a surprise for people that yeah oh my God, there's black scouses. Yeah. <laughs> Which is crazy. But yeah, thank you. Misha? Um, firstly, I just want to say a huge thank you just to like everybody for like everything that we've spoken about because like I graduated from uni like two years ago so I'm now in the midst of like applying for like all funding and whatever else but it's actually been really insightful working in the equality sector of higher education and working with different organisations and stuff and like the work that everybody does I know that sometimes it can seem like as if it's not doing anything but like I feel like I am proof that it is actually working yeah. because I didn't see that there was going to be a pathway for myself to go into any type of work in a space like university working or working with an organisation like Black Lives Music. And it's these types of conversations with all of you guys that enables us to actually mm -hmm. see ourselves replicated in the industry. So thank you for that. Um, and I think following on representation and having it pushed in people's faces like let them hear mm -hmm. let them hear the music let them see the people like let them feel uncomfortable in spaces because it's not something that it doesn't affect them so it, it doesn't need to revolve around them yeah. and I think that that would ultimately help because there's only so much that you can do when you're the person that's experienced that yeah thank you final word Eunice um, equally thank you for having me and allowing me to speak into what's happening in Liverpool at the moment I think credit is my word. Mm. Credit from a perspective of actually crediting the music makers who are championing, as Emmy was saying, so many different genres. And when we talk about black music, it's not just black people that make black music. Yeah. Um, so it's that credit. And also I'm going to come back to just because we're talking about industry here and I was having this conversation with some colleagues at the back there credit in terms of economic credit for what is being put out there because yeah. this is a business yeah. it's an industry that doesn't be, no one should be scared of those words because that doesn't mean you're taking out a heart and soul from it because mm. from my perspective business doesn't function without people so we're at the center of that but it's crediting people for their musical um their musical product and their musical expertise yeah. and their passion and financially crediting them as well. So I think those would make a difference and really make changes. For even more insight on this subject, do make sure you read the full remap report and the link will be in the description to do that. Thank you very much for listening and I'll see you next week. <laughs>